This is the immortal Matt Brown, and you're watching MMA Meltdown. Welcome to MMA Meltdown. I'm your host, Blaze, hanging out with you. We're going to be coming with you live and direct with some of the hottest news, entertainment, and lifestyle with the MMA from all the way around the world. And I'm pretty sure to my left, you might know who this young man is, but we'll, we'll get to him here in a hot second. But to my right is a world-class young man, Mr. Zach Gonzalez. Can you tell him about yourself a little bit? Wonderful. Man? Thanks for having me, guys. Um, my name is Zach. I'm a, I'm a local uh, jiu-jitsu practitioner here in Denver, Colorado. I teach the kids program at Denver Jiu-Jitsu, and I'm really looking forward to working with you guys. No, that's awesome, man. That's pretty awesome. And then over here to my right, we got uh, Mike Larita. I'm Mike Larita, uh, known as the coach. I spent 29 years coaching wrestling. I'm a teacher, uh, actually the dean of students at Thomas Jefferson High School, so I deal with discipline all day. Uh, had a couple of MMA fights, uh, one at age 52, one at age 55. So been around combat sports all my life, uh, enjoy them, and like to talk about them. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Let's talk about this, man. So uh, to my left, we have Mr. Gilbert Smith, Jr. Coming off a big win in the RFA. Gilbert, how you doing? I'm doing great, brother. I'm doing awesome. Yeah, you know what? Actually, people call me Jamal, but, you know, together it's Gilbert Jamal Smith, Jr., but, yeah, you can call me either. Yeah, we want to get it right. We, we want to yeah. get it right. I don't yeah. want you putting me in a choke. Yeah, but then, <laughs> I mean, get, get your name you can wrong. call me Gilbert, but uh, I, I'd rather Jamal. Okay, perfect. Yeah, perfect. All right. Jamal, you run Victory Mar Mixed Martial Arts. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, uh, Victory MMA was a school I started back in 2009, and it was, was kind of like my baby. Actually, I started it back in Baghdad, Iraq, when I was training some of the soldiers when I was out there doing civilian contracting. And I always loved the name Victory because I think it's so profound. It really sets the tone of what you're trying to accomplish. So when I came to Colorado Springs and I had a couple of dollars, I was like, you know what? I want to do something that I feel passionate about. Because back then I was an IT guy with my computers and I was certified in so many different things. IT? Yeah, IT, information technology, baby. All right. So you're yeah. more than a fighter. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Believe it or not, believe it or not. All right. uh, so I, I started Victory MMA and we've been going strong. We've got some strong guys coming out the camp and I'm proud of it. Good, good. Down in the Springs. You're down in Colorado mm -hmm. Springs. Now, talk, talk to us a little bit about your last fight, too. Uh, it, was, it was in the RFA. Um, you had a, a very tough opponent. You came in as the underdog, but you were still managed to get the win here. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, uh, it seems like almost every fight I, I, I come into, uh, I'm the underdog, and that's fine, because you know, that stuff don't really matter. It's about two people stepping in a cage and putting heart, their heart on the line. Uh, but that particular fight was very important because, you know, dealing with fighting in Colorado, which I haven't fought in Colorado in a very long time, and my family, my friends, my kids, it was so awesome to be there. And, uh, and a guy, you know, he bought a really good fight, so I was able to showcase more of my skill set. Well, you definitely, you definitely had to overcome a little bit of adversity there in the first round. You took a pretty mean head kick, but were able to come back and steal the victory over there. So congratulations on that win for sure. Did I get hit kick? I don't know about that. <laughs> Blocked it. Yeah, Blocked yeah, it. Yeah, never heard of your head kick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is there any other things besides, you know, the, the, the fighting that you're interested in? Uh, you know, right now, it's, it's, it's all about fighting. My, my yeah. life is surrounded about Perfect. training and fighting and and uh, if people know me, they understand the hard work and dedication I put into my career. Um, I'm fortunate at times I feel like a sacrifice. I sacrifice time for my family. I sacrifice a, a really stable um, a social life because it's just all about fighting right now. Right, and you know, and I watched. Uh, I watched uh, in the last uh, for your last fight. You kind of rebuilt yourself up after coming out of the Ultimate Fighter house. Uh, you, you put on a bunch of weight lost the weight, put it back on in muscle, and you really kind of uh, reinvented yourself as a fighter. Are, are you looking to make a statement and trying to get back into the UFC? Is that what you're looking to do? Well, see, coming off the, the Ultimate Fighter, uh, which was probably one of the most depressing times of my life, it was last, it was April of 2013. You know, people don't understand how much you really give up to fight, and when you don't get that success, it really takes you back a lot. But um, back then, I was a middleweight, so I was fighting at 185. And I actually fought two more fights, which was victories. And my coach, Mark Montoya, and some of my other coaches said, Jamal, you're a good fighter, but you could be a great fighter if you fight at 170. And I, I didn't want to hear it because I like to eat. I like to have a good time. <laughs> right, it wasn't right. too bad. But finally, I decided to make the cut. And it's, it's, been a, uh, it's been hard, difficult, but it's been a lot of success. 
So since since Ultimate Fighter, I have fought six times in the last sixteen months and won five out of six. And the only person that I didn't beat was Brian Foster, who was like a really legit dude out the UFC, thirty something fights. We fought a hard fight. I'm the only guy to ever take him to a decision. And, got 22 wins, and I'm only a guy ever took it to the and not And you were, not only did you win those fights, but you were the underdog in all those fights as well. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting interesting thing going on here. <laughs> when I, I think you said the thing, the key. It, when you go into the cage, it doesn't matter whether you're the underdog or not. Yeah. If you've got enough heart and you believe, that's what brings you through. Yeah, I'm not going to break. Like, I mean, to beat me, you have to beat me. Don't get me wrong. Any given Sunday, you could win or lose, and I could definitely win or lose like a man, but I, I'm not going to give it to you. If you're going to beat mm-hmm. me, you're going to have to beat me. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned Mark Montoya, Factory X. I know that's where you're training now. Yeah. Uh, what's the biggest differences from what you were doing before to Factory X now? Well, before I was training myself. No, don't get me wrong. I had my coaches. I had uh, Curtis Hill. He's in Castle Rock Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I had uh, Carl, Carl Sabero. He's from Hustle Hard Boxing. And I had my, uh, one of my best friends, uh, David Lawrence. He's a chiropractor, but he's one, one of my top students. And all those guys really helped me out. But it was kind of like specialists. So I went, I went to Mark Montoya to get a, a coach that been to that level that could put the whole game plan together for me. Because uh, I would go to my boxing, work boxing, th- then I would go to my grappling guy, work some grappling, but it wasn't put together. It was me that put it together. So Mark Montoya was, it was able to uh, help me formalize game plans and, and work with my other coaches and, and put it together. Plus, the talent that we have, a factory X, I mean, I'm telling you right now, in another year, we're going to be the best gym in the world, guaranteed, hands down. Good, good. With along with that in the training, mention some of your training partners. Uh, I mean, we got Chris Camozzi, we got Brian Rogers, we got Dustin, Dustin uh, Jacoby, Marcus Edwards. You know, Joe Warren. You know, a champion, and he's been there. Uh, Nate, Nate Marquette, uh, Neil Magny. Like the the plethora of people that come uh, to Factory X is, is so vast and so great. Then I also got my guys. And, and, uh, and Kyra Springs from Victor Evan May that's really making a huge come up, like my conversion up. People don't know that name, but I guarantee you, give it another year or two and you're gonna hear this guy go from an amateur to the pro, knocking people out. Remember that name, yeah. fight fans. Remember my, that name. My now you're still signed with RFA, correct? Technically, no. No, okay. Uh, it was a one fight deal, and it was just kind of like what I like. But, you know, we never know how the future, you know, uh, you know, play out. So what I are you think, what are you looking for next? Let's well, put it that way. You know, okay. if, if if I could write my own story, I'd be in the UFC. I'd be fighting February 14th in the UFC. However, uh, that may not happen. So right now, uh, I'm looking at RFA, and I want that 170 pound title. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. We're gonna heard it to the UFC. Yeah, yeah you heard it here. You heard it here on MMA Meltdown. Gilbert Smith looking for that RFA title. Definitely. I uh, really, in my eyes, is already mine. I just gotta go out there and win it. Absolutely. So uh, hopefully we can make that happen. You hear him, RFA. Gilbert Smith wants that title shot. Let's give it to him. Let's give it to him. UFC, baby. We're all the way. MMA Meltdown hanging out with you. My man Big Mike, Zach, and Blaze, and the main man Jamal. We'll be right back. Welcome back. My name is Jacinta Lovato. I am one of the guest hosts here today. And my first fighter interview is with... Gilbert Jamal Smith. Oh, hold on. Really? By the way, your hair looks great. Oh, thank you. I just want to let you know. <laughs> I was a little worried about my hair, but he says it looks great. Yeah, so awesome. I'm going to believe him. So what was your name again? I'm sorry. Uh, it's Gilbert Jamal Smith. Okay, Gilbert Jamal Smith. <laughs> For those of you, Junior. To, Junior. <laughs> For those of you who don't, who aren't familiar with Gilbert, he fights out of Colorado Springs, and uh, you have a next fight. You have a really big fight coming up, don't you? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, well, right now we're still trying to work out the details, so hopefully uh, it will be a big fight. Uh, but right now, it's nothing official. And who are you training with? Uh, right now, I'm a lot of people, but my main training camp is with Factory X in Inglewood, Colorado, and also my camp, um, Victory MMA in Colorado Springs, CSU Pablo for wrestling, Castle Rock for uh, for jiu-jitsu, and Hustle Hard Boxing for boxing, so I'm all over the place. That's awesome. So one of the things that we're going to be talking about today in the, um, the news section of the show is, you know, they're enforcing some UFC uniforms. How do you feel about that? 
Well, uh, I think it's kind of good for some of the fighters in the UFC, considering that getting sponsorship money is very difficult. Me, myself, you see my T-shirt, but with a lot of sponsors, I, you know, we really don't make a lot of money. So it's, it's very hard for fighters to get money from sponsors, and some companies don't want to pay you. Checks get bounced. So if you could get a direct, confirmed, guaranteed money every fight, I can't argue with it. Yeah, I can't argue with that either. And what are your aspirations for your career this year? Um, make it to the UFC. I mean, that's, uh, that's what I want to uh, do. I've been there, I got a little taste of it, and I want more. I think I deserve to be there. I think I, think I could beat a lot of the guys in the UFC, and I'm ready. I believe you. <laughs> he said that with such conviction, didn't yeah. he? I am ready. Yeah. So if he says he's ready, I believe him. I'm on board. Well, it was very nice talking to you, and I can't wait to see you in the future in the UFC, by the way. I believe that we will be seeing him. Looks so, like here. Look yeah. <laughs>
So to be a world champion, you need to be a black belt at all these different sports. You know, it takes a lot of years, a lot of muscle memory for a wrestler to understand mm -hmm. how to box. So you just see what happens, it's it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. And in any fight, it ends up getting to a hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, position, and it, you fall back onto a pedigree, and that's my that's where I'm the best at. So I can always fall back onto that double leg takedown and uh, my anti-jujitsu, you know, I mean. <laughs> that's your favorite? I, that's your favorite yeah. move? Well, double? My anti-jujitsu, because I fight so many black belts, I don't like to mess around with them, so I like to just put myself in a position where I'm safe and can cause some damage. Sure, <laughs> absolutely. Hey, you, you took a first fight, your mm -hmm. first fight was in Japan, I believe. Yep. Tell us how you got that first fight. I know it's a great story. Yeah, I mean, I was uh, I was actually on the mountain, man. I was on snowmast on the top of that mountain, you know, and um, I got a call like seven in the morning. It was from Dan Henderson. He was like, I got your fight. It's in Japan right now. And I said, you know, I don't fight. You know, what are you talking about? And he's, they, they were gonna pay me, so I jumped on a plane. I jumped on a plane that next night and flew right to uh, Temecula, and two weeks later, I was fighting in Japan. You know, it was like 40-some thousand people, and it was uh, kind of, you know, throw, throw in the deep end, learn how to swim, you know? So that's kind of <laughs> what happened, you know? And I, I beat some real good guys those two fights, and then lost in that final fight, and uh, then started Bellator, you know, mm -hmm. started fighting in the U.S., so it was exciting. That's, that's really cool, uh, coming into that fight and getting that first, how, how did it feel getting that first TKO victory yeah. and just getting in there and getting the job done? I was done? just happy the fight was over, you know? Like, uh, <laughs> I never fought anybody. I always had a nice shirt on and a girl with me. I didn't want to lose either one, you know? So I didn't get in bar fights, you know? So <laughs> I was, uh, it was uh, kind of scary. It was a lot harder than the, what I expected. And, um, you know, for him to have to not be able to come out that second round, it was really, really nice for me. I yeah. was, was just like, <sighs> I can breathe. Well, you just had this title fight. What are your plans for 2015? You know, what, are you, what are you looking to do and uh, who are you looking to fight? I plan on beating up some Brazilians again in Bellator cage. <laughs> uh, that's usually what happens. Uh, next one, March 27th, I fight um, Marcus Galvo and uh, defend this belt here. And then afterwards, it looks like I'll fight. I'm not sure, you know, a lot of people running their mouths yeah. right now, so one of them. I love it, it's like, you know, uh, Muhammad Ali giving all that talk, you know. Absolutely. This guy right here, yeah, like, like, to me, he's like Muhammad Ali, like to yeah, bring it on. I'm gonna whoop somebody's ass. I, I, yeah, I, I, you, know, you got, you got to hold it. that belt strong. No, you know, people right. are coming for it. I am, uh, I'm actually really excited to see your next fight, yeah. though, and uh, it, it, it's just, I'm really excited to see it. I'm Thank so you, man. Excited. Yeah, and you guys got to come see us at Factory X. Got a lot of tough fighters down there. All, all of us Colorado, Colorado fighters, we we rock the Bellator uh, flag down there, so it's mm -hmm. it's nice. And we're we're real excited about your show, and I'm happy That's to be cool. on the first one. We need some, yeah. some Bellator yeah. gears. What we need. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've got the uh, you got like six Bellator guys down at yeah, Factory X. Yeah, we got a lot X, of guys. Right? We got yeah. Dustin Jacoby and Brian Rogers and. Chris Camozzi, we're hoping to get over get there. Get him somewhere. You know, Brian, yeah. uh, you know, Brendan Ward. We just got a lot of good, good guys over there right now. Good quality set of guys. That's good. That's good. The, uh, one of the things you do really well is you agitate opponents. Yeah, <laughs> you, do. <laughs> you, you, you do a great job at that, and I love it. I mean, sometimes they need that because yep. that gives them that little kick in the pants to fight. What... What's your method behind your madness? Yeah, you know, it's always, sometimes it's not being the best athlete, it's being the best actor sometimes. You know, a lot of this, you need to sell fights sometimes, and I, and I can sell a fight, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it's easy for me to talk about myself because I believe in my technique and believe in myself, <laughs> yeah. so it's easy for me to talk shit. Yeah, uh, but, you know, a lot of guys that don't believe in their really, that they can go get the job done, it's hard for them. So I make them, make them have to do that. I make them get in their face a little bit, make them be outspoken about themselves, and they're not confident about that. And yeah. it's really, and it shows a lot on camera when you're not confident. It seems like you're winning the mental and so, battle. Yeah, yeah. so, so yeah. But it doesn't work always in my favor though, you know I mean? No, Sometimes I'm in the cage and a guy comes up and tells me he's gonna kill me, and you know, and he's like, we're finally in the cage, and I go back to the corner, I'm like, Mark, I probably shouldn't have pissed this guy off <laughs> so bad, because he's really upset right now, yeah. you know? Well, another thing I think, one of the things that fighters don't really like is a five-round fight. Yeah. But being a wrestler, you're a grinder. 
Yeah, that's, I just know that if kind it of needs thing you to do. go to that that mm -hmm. that point, then I'm fine there. You know, and a lot of people yeah. do. They, you know, they're 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 scared of the five the five rounds. Sometimes you got to drag them into yeah, deep I, water. I would like. I don't want to ever. I don't. You know, I'm I'm trying to finish the fight. Yeah, but oh, yeah. you know, sometimes it takes a you know. Sometimes you got to drag them to the water, try to drown them a little bit before <laughs> yeah. you can finish the opponent, yeah, right? Yeah. So. Keep them down so he can't knock you out. That's, That's right. Absolutely. That's absolutely. Right. Hanging out on MMA meltdown, Mr. Joe Warren, the baddest man in the world. Yeah, I mean, I, I love it. <laughs> When you can say in the globe, you, the can't, you can't get one of these in case you whoop his hands, all right? <laughs> we'll be right back. MMA Meltdown. Hi everybody, it's Jacinta Lobato and I am back. Uh, one of the things that we were talking about off camera that I felt was really interesting and I wanted to kind of get your opinion on it is how the NBA players and NFL players are very much different than the UFC and um, Bellator fighters and MMA fighters. Um, can you talk about what's the difference in Combat sports, you know, pro sports are a lot different than team sports, you know, uh, mixed martial arts is more individual. Yeah. You know, you don't have a team in that cage with you, so it's a little bit different. But we all come from similar colleges together, all went to school together, all the pros uh, in, the, uh, in the cage and on the field. So, so very similar people. We still get to run around with them, and they're, they're big fight fans. So we're fans of them, and they're fans of us. One of the things that I've really noticed is that the UFC fighters, no, it doesn't matter how big they are, the MMA fighters, Bellator fighters, no matter how big or small or beginner that they are, they are very humble people. And one of the misconceptions that I have seen is that a lot of people feel that they may be like overly aggressive or violent types because of the nature of the industry. But if you get to know these guys, there is actually a really tight-knit community and it seems very family-oriented with a lot of really, really good people in it. So I wanted to congratulate you on that because I feel like a lot of the, the fighters are really humble, honest, good people. I'm not very humble, but I do have a family. So, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm the baddest man on the planet for a reason, you know, so. But you I, heard that first, he's the baddest yeah. man in the planet. For a reason, you know, you gotta have some big balls to rock that name, so I, but I do have a beautiful family, wife, two kids, so. I, you know, I do take care of them every day. We're training during the day, but I'm, I'm dad at night and in the morning, so. And he trains hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We train smart, not hard. <laughs> smart, not hard. He said it first. So what is it that you're holding? This is a belt right here, world championship belt. Bellator Bantamweight world champ. Baddest man on the planet right here. So we brought this in to make you look a little better. So that's... <laughs> so who's your next fight? Uh... Next fight is Marcus Galvo, March uh, 27th. Uh, defend this belt. I just won it from uh, Dantes. Um, when, when did I win that? I think September. So uh, we've been having a lot of fun with this since. What do you think about the UFC enforcing a uniform policy? I know you're not with the UFC, yep. but what do you think about that? Well, it's, it's, it's good for other fighters like Bellator. You know, we're, we'll be able to still sponsor on the actual um, athlete. So it's good for me. Yeah. You know, it's bad for them, good for me. It's good for people that are ranked number one or world champs because they're still going to get money. The top, like, ten guys will still, you know, get their sponsorship money. So that's good, but not for not everyone. So, so yeah. it's, it kind of it makes it smaller, but it's better for the guys on top. And what do you think about um, Eminem and Ronda Rousey? Have you heard this news? Yeah, I heard the song. It doesn't, it doesn't really bother me. You know, I mean, it's Eminem, you know. I mean, that means she's popular now. And what do you think about women fighters? Do you think that they have to fight harder in the UFC and MMA and Bellator to strike force? Actually, does Bellator have women fighters? They do, don't they? Uh, we did. I think it'll be back this season also, you know, and it's, uh, I don't know if they need to fight harder. They fight hard enough. If you've watched a female fight, they, it's one of the most violent things you're going to see. So, you know, I try to stay away from those female fights when it's <laughs> Yeah, I would too. Well, thank you for coming in and, uh, yeah. I don't really need to explain much when I have him next to me. I'm a little tongue-tied right now because uh, he's a very impressive fighter. So we are very happy to have him in on the first episode of MMA Health. Thank you. <laughs> MMA Meltdown hanging out with you. Man, I thought I was going to have to put one of these fighters in a grapple hold, man, and just to let them know I can fight. <laughs> I know, too, absolutely. <laughs> Looks like Joe Warren was getting pretty close he to He was, man. I, you know, I didn't want to put my little hold on him. But, but you know Joe's I mean? the smallest, man. That was your chance. In fact, he's the smallest <laughs> and the baddest in the world. I'm like, self-proclaimed. Yeah, self-proclaimed. <laughs> 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 okay. Oh, we heard it there. Chris is calling him out. <laughs>
So we're, we're here with Chris Camozzi, who's just off a, a big win um, in, uh, is, it, is it the Fight to Win? Fight to PFC. Win PFC. Prize, prize Fighting Champion. Prize Fighting Champion. Yes, yes. and um, it was a very quick fight. Ended in, uh, what was the time on that thing? It was like less than a minute, right? No, it was, I think it was three minutes. Three minutes in yeah. the first round with a rear naked choke, right? Yeah. Man, tell us a little bit about that fight. Tell us uh, what it was like to get that finish and walk away unscathed. Well, it was good, you know. Um, I wanted to go in there and prove that I, I belong on the higher level still. Um, you know, after getting released by the UFC, it's always a little depressing, but at the same time, you know, new doors open all the time. Um, so going in there, you know, I knew Jeremy real well. I've known him for years. Um, we've trained together. We've, you know, seen each other for years. So I knew going in there um, what I was up against, and I just needed to prove that I, uh, that I still belong where I should be. Man, that's, one. Yeah. that's great. Now, there was a kind of a fiasco at weigh-ins. I know Jeremy didn't make weight. What had to go through everything to get that fight to go off? Um, you know, Jeremy... Nice guy, I like him, but he's known for, for missing weight. Yes, so, not the first time. <laughs> I, I planned for it the whole camp, we knew it, and uh, you know, I planned on taking 50% of his purse if he missed weight. So the morning of weigh-ins, I text Seth, the promoter, and I said, tell Jeremy if he comes in overweight, I'm taking 50% of his purse. And he said, well, that's between you guys, you gotta figure that out. And then hours later, he texts me and he was like, man, you were right, how'd you know? And I said, I didn't know, but I was guessing. So he was over six pounds. Mm. And, uh, you know, they, they try to negotiate with me at weigh-ins, and you know, I just don't think that there's any negotiation. Normally it's 20%, but, you know, I think it might have been his fifth time missing weight, so I wanted 50%. Mm -hmm. So when a, person, when a person misses weight, they lose a percentage they lose of their a purse. Percentage of their whole mm -hmm. entire purse? Yeah. 50 or win or lose, win or lose, absolutely. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a professional sport. You should act like a professional. Um, and part of acting like a professional is signing the contract and, and agreeing on weight. On weight. And one. making yes. that weight. Yeah. You know, making weight is the first fight for me. I don't even think about the fight. I'm not nervous about the fight. Making weight and weigh-ins, I always get nervous for because you, know, you never know how well, hard Well, uh, what do you walk around at? Um, it just depends. You know, I get up 210, 215. Um, so the cut to 185 is... It can be tough, but I do it the right way. I got the right people around. There you me, go. Nutritionists mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. So you know, with cutting weight, uh, we just we had Gilbert uh, we had Gilbert Smith in here earlier, and uh, the main card on his fight was a for a title shot and maybe a shot in the UFC. And the uh, the challenger missed weight. Yeah. And uh, by four and four or five, and, uh, got himself taken out of the shot for the UFC and a chance for the title. I mean, this is kind of what we're talking about: holding yourself to that professional level. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the UFC does not want to sign you and then have you come in and miss weight because it's a big fiasco for them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, not every time the opponent sometimes will say, well, I'm not fighting if you're not on weight, which, uh, sure. you know, I'll never do. I'll, I'll fight him if he's a heavyweight, but I just want to get paid for it. You own Performance MMA. Tell us a little bit about it. Um, you know, my wife and I bought it. It's performancemma.com, and then we have a brick and mortar store right here in Denver. Um, we're the only one from here to Vegas, as far as I know. Um, and it's been fun. It's a business for me to um, secure another income outside of getting punched. Punch <laughs> people. And uh, so we, we carry athletic apparel, um, training gear, geese, boxing gloves, anything you can think of that you need for MMA, CrossFit, yoga, whatever. I've got it. Um, and it's been fun. It's a new challenge, but my store is right next door to the gym. So I open the store, I go train, go back to the store and I go train again. And it's it's a lot of fun for me because I enjoy being at the gym. Absolutely, uh, and and with with having the store, like you said, I think you're the only provider of jujitsu equipment, apparel, MMA gear in town. So I mean, if you're here in Denver and you're looking for sports equipment, that's probably the the best place for to to go. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, it's a smaller business. It's not you know Dicks or Sports Authority or anything. So I think a lot of people enjoy that they can come in and I can help them pick out gear, try it on, tell them how to fit. Um, and everything like that. So you get more of a personal approach to small business. And, uh, you know, I like to think that my opinion on the gear is a lot better than somebody working at Dick's. Plus, I think so. I think, I think that uh, yeah. the, the, uh, former UFC fighter Chris Camozzi has a little bit more to say than a Dick's sporting good uh, employee. So. Sure. MMA Meltdown hanging out with Chris Camozzi. Me and the crew will be right back here in a minute, baby. Thanks. Back again at Pasinta. I'm one of your hosts on MMA Meltdown. With me, I have Chris Camozzi. Chris Camozzi. Now, Chris Camozzi, as you may or may not know, is from. Well, actually, are you from Colorado or are you fight out of Colorado? 
A um, little bit of both. I, uh, I moved here from California when I was like 12, so. Now, Chris, you're just coming off of a win, correct? Yeah, I just won two weeks ago here in Denver, Colorado for PFC. Awesome, and who did you fight against? Uh, I fought against Jeremy Kimball. He's a Bellator veteran. Awesome, and what was one of the highlights of the fight? Uh, you know, the whole fight was pretty quick, so I guess it was all a highlight. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, quick rear naked choke and uh, no damage done to me. How quick was quick? Uh, three minutes. Wow, yeah, that is pretty fast, I have to say. <laughs> so if, later on, we're gonna be talking about some of the news that's going on with UFC. And one of the big things is the uniforms. For everybody out there that doesn't know, um, UFC is actually gonna be enforcing a uniform policy, and they just signed a contract with, I believe it is Reebok. What are your feelings about that? Um, well, right now, I don't have to worry about it, but uh, for me, I made a lot of my money off sponsorships. I've made a lot more money than most of the guys, you know, ranked higher than me in sponsorships because I have a good management team. And, uh, you know, it's... Andy's very personable, by the way. He's a very humble guy. <laughs> no, it's, it's a little disappointing, I think, because I don't know if that money will translate. You know, Reebok's going to pay the fighters, but I don't think it would match what I was making. So if I was back in there right now, I think I'd be losing money off of it. But it's still new, so I think we have to give it a little bit of time to see. And what are your asks? Are you trying to get back into the UFC, or what are your plans for the future? What are you? What's your going forward? What are you going to do now? Um, you know, we'll see. There's a lot of places I want to fight. I want to. I want to fight Muay Thai. I want to kickbox. Um, stick with MMA still. But there's a lot of things I want to do. You know, so if the UFC comes back around and they want me again, then so be it. But if not, there's plenty of other good organizations for me to fight for. Oh, yeah. And I kind of, I, I believe that he does have a future um, in fighting because I know he's very, very, how do you say, I'm dedicated to his sport. And he's actually a favorite around Denver. A lot of people know this guy and really believe in him. So we, I wanted to tell you that I do believe in you and I do think that you're going to have a great career in front of you. And you already have had some pretty good highlights in the past. So thank you for stopping by and interviewing with me. And I feel really proud that I got to interview Chris Kamosi, everybody. <laughs>
you know, I, really, I go into every fight with, with zero anticipation. Okay. I don't expect anything to happen, good or bad. I go in with a conscious decision to be the best that I can be, fight the best fight that I can fight, and allow the fight to progress naturally as it, as it goes along. And uh, it just happens that my fights end up being pretty good. But Do you watch the fights after, of afterwards? Of course, yeah. 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 Over and over and over and analyze everything play by play. Yeah, and yeah. I try not to too much. I actually have to force myself not to because I think, you know, you can't get you know too in, involved in what happened in the past. You, you can't, right. you can't, you know, worry too much about it. As it, as it happened, um, you just let it go, right? You know, um, it, it's easy to find a lot of negative things that happen, right. even in a win, a loss. You know, you could have. You know, I, I've won fights in under a minute, and I can go back and be like, oh, I did this wrong, I did this wrong. But I don't want to dwell on the, the negative parts. I want to right. move towards the future and, and just become a better fighter next time. So you were on the brink of quitting MMA before you landed your spot on the Ultimate Fighter Season 7. Can you talk about why you almost gave up fighting and that time of your life? Yeah, that's, that's funny. I don't get asked that question a lot, even though it's a, it's a pretty major part of my life. You know, I was just at a crossroads where I focused uh, so much of my life uh, towards getting to the UFC and making a career out of fighting, and I sacrificed so much. I mean, you know, just uh, poor all the time, living wherever I could, always starving, never having anything, couldn't afford a freaking haircut, you know what I mean? Right. So uh, it was just kind of starting to wear on me, and I finally, that was the first time I'd actually, in, in my life, had a good job. I lived in uh, New York City, and I got a really great job uh, being a personal trainer and was making really good money, um, but I had to work lots and lots of hours, right, to make that money, especially in New York City. That's the way it is there. So um, basically, just at that point in my life, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna keep training for fun, and I think I'll just, you know, make good money and live an easier life, you know. Um, may settle down a little bit and everything. And, I, and by that time, you know, I got in a part of a, a what really, drove me in martial arts was uh, um, changing my life from, um, you know, a partier, drinker and all this to yeah. uh, positive energy and doing something positive with my life. Well, I'd already changed that at that point. So that I was, was afterwards? Uh, that was, long, well, the drinking stuff was long before right. that. So I, I was, you know, clean, sober, and feeling good about life and everything. I pretty much accomplished that uh, mission in my life. So I was like, okay, I was pretty happy in a good place. Mm -hmm. And that was actually when um, the tryouts for the Ultimate Fighter came up in Newark, New Jersey. And after you got the call from the USC, what was that feeling that you had going into the house oh, and going man. into that competition? That was that is the most intense period of my life. I mean, right. that was just, you know, everybody always says, you know, we all know each fight's the biggest fight of your life. You know, there's a crossroads you're gonna take every time. You're gonna go this way if you win, this way if you lose, right? But that one was the biggest crossroads. Sure, when you walk up to that building, you see those three big letters up on the, on the building. Uh, it, it was, yeah, it was scary, you know? And, the, and that was the first season where you had to fight to get on. And they didn't tell us we had to fight to get on. Oh, wow. And it was at 185, and I'm a 170 pound fighter. So I could, wow. you know, one of I the cut smaller guys in the house. Yeah, I didn't cut any weight or anything. I mean, I was eating everything I could just to maintain the weight. I was, you know, a little lighter back right. then. So and coming in at that point, I mean, I, I, I remember standing backstage and thinking about it. You know, you know, wow, this is my this life. Is, you know, this, this is, is this is it. You know, this is all I got. And how many years sober are you going on? Um, I never really count it. You, you don't know? count? <laughs> you know, yeah, I know that you know a lot of the guys, you know, they do like this many days and, and years and all that stuff. That's never really been my style. I mean, basically, like when I walked away from it, like I didn't look back, you know what I mean? Awesome. And, um, you know, like I, a lot of people say, you know, is it hard for you to talk about that or whatever? And I say, I say no, it's not because, you know, I, I literally feel like I'm talking about a different person. Right. As in, like, I, my brother or my cousin or something. Like, someone that, like, it wasn't, it literally was not me back then, you know what I mean? And I think that was one of the, the, the greatest things that martial arts brought to my life was I found myself. And that's one of the, the most beautiful things about the sport itself is uh, you, you find out the truth of every person, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, if you fight long enough, I, I don't care uh, who you are. You do it long enough, you're going to find out who you are. Fighting out of Columbus, Ohio!
the gossip, all of the MMA. Now, one of the things that I've been really checking out is this Ronda Rousey versus Eminem. And I don't know if you guys know much about it, but basically Eminem came out with a new song and he mentioned Ronda Rousey and he called her, I believe it was, a slaughterhouse and a blouse. I think that's cool. I'm not perfect. This is a quote from Ronda Rousey on her reaction. Uh, I think Eminem, Eminem might put her in a chokehold though. No, yeah. Ronda Rousey's gonna <laughs> on bar him. Yeah, I, don't, yeah I, don't, I don't know if, I don't know if, I, I, I think I would choose someone a little bit Different than Ronda Rousey, um, and the women's women's champion of the world to to, to rap about, to speak derogatory. Well, about she's a not, bit. you know, Mariah Carey, because in that big, you know, actually, I feel like Mariah Carey might have won at that first battle because she came out with that other song against him and actually was a top hit, it sold even more than his song did. So when it comes to him versus Ronda Rousey, it's not like you know Mariah Carey's gonna smack him back, but right. I think Ronda Rousey might. Ronda, Ronda mm -hmm. is about to get rich off of this, all right? She's Probably. Eminem a fool. <laughs> you know, they have all kind of t-shirts and dolls wrapped around this one. Well, I just thought it was crazy that she considered it like flattering that he mentioned her, but if you really you know go online like I did and check out exactly what the lyrics were, they weren't flattering. So no. it was kind of like, what did you did you not hear what he said about you? Like, what were you thinking? But at the same time, I think Ronda. Ronda Rousey is one of those girls that she doesn't care, you know? She doesn't care what anybody no. thinks about her, oh, uh, yeah. what anybody says about her. The only thing that matters is when those cage doors close, she's gonna turn it turn it into a different animal and she's gonna finish the fight, which she has proven time and time again. Yeah. And she's all about making money. Yeah, definitely mm -hmm. making a lot of that right yeah. now. Well, they're making news, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing that I wanted to talk about is War Machine. Now, I know everybody has probably seen all of the Facebook posts and all of the craziness going on with him, him laughing in court. Basically, you know, his ex-wife accused him of abuse and he's on, I, was it trial? Yeah, former, yeah. former porn star wife. Former, yeah, former uh, porn star, let's get it right. Yeah, former porn <laughs> yeah, star yeah, wife. Yeah, yeah, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta uh, be very specific. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, accused him of uh, uh, spousal abuse, obviously. And it, it what was, kind of spousal, was yelling, uh, screaming? No, no it, it got physical, did you, oh, did you physical, see the pictures? Very physical, yes. Oh my goodness, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, Christy Mack was, did not look like she was in a, a good state after that, after that altercation, that's for sure. From what I, from what I remember, he, she had accused him of physical abuse, even sexual abuse, and emotional abuse. So when she was describing one of the incidents when he had abused her, he started laughing in court. And when you seen the video on Facebook, you didn't actually see him on camera laughing, but you could kind of hear him in the background like chuckling. And then the attorney pointed it out like, did you just laugh? You know, let everybody in the world know that this got this guy, <laughs> I know I can't say what I want to say, but yeah. this guy was laughing about, you know, abusing his, his ex while, she, you know, she's crying and they're mm -hmm. showing pictures of her. So anyways, the whole reason I brought this topic up is because I feel like there's a terrible misperception of fighters that they walk around and they're abusive people that, you know, they, they pick fights on the streets and they're these really, you know, hyped up men but from working i mean you guys could probably attest to this but working with them and getting to know them they're not all like that well you know i mean as a as a practitioner and, and mike being a practitioner as well i think that he could probably uh, uh agree with me here that i i think that mixed martial arts jujitsu all of these uh extracurricular activities don't necessarily make you more aggressive for me it's humbled my uh, humbled my personal experience you know um uh, once you learn some of these things you want to use them less and less does that make sense yeah you know i, I don't want well, also the, the the people that are like that they they've got a wire crossed somewhere or they're yeah. five cans short of a six pack yeah you know one or the other uh you know, a normal normal human being is not going to be that way, whether they're a fighter or not. That yeah. that doesn't change that. Yeah. And you know, Zach just kind of hit the nail on the head. You humble yourself for those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So that would be my kind of a reply. Yeah, I, I think right. it's I think it's an, I think it's really difficult to to say just because you're an MMA fighter, you're an aggressive person in any 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 portion of your life. Well, it's, yeah. been, it's been in the news now, you know, with domestic violence with uh, football players. And, Absolutely, mm -hmm. and it's happening sport. in every so sport. It's, yeah. So it's sure. like, you know, every athlete that's huge or touching someone in a, in a sport is getting accused of just being... Right. 
Right, yeah. right. Well, and I think that when I when I got to be around the fighters for the first time, and you see these guys, they kind of travel with their families. I, I met this one fighter, what was it? Um, well, I met a fighter and his mom, his dad, his sisters, his brothers had actually traveled to Denver and all wore his t-shirts mm -hmm. to support what it is that he was doing. So if this guy is this violent, aggressive type, then why would his yeah. family be back? I really don't believe that that stereotype is something that's validated with these. No, it is. It, it's it sad is. that we have to have a situation wanna... like War Machine bring these kinds of issues into light um, because I don't think that you'd ever really be hearing about uh, violence with MMA um, uh, pro professionals if, if it wasn't for this gentleman. And we're still yeah. talking about him even weeks after this has happened. I really wanted this show to get rid of that myth and help help everybody out there realize that these guys are hardworking, hard training athletes who really care about the sport and what it is that they do. And they deserve a reputation for being hard workers and not being aggressive, you know. Right. Well, I also, this also goes into the people words, at home. <laughs> well, this also goes, this also uh, goes to a message to the viewers at home. Don't be afraid to step into your local MMA gym right. and use it as a mm -hmm. way to get back in shape just because you're a little intimidated by these fighters. I guarantee you go and walk into one of these gyms like uh, like, like our gym here at Denver Jiu-Jitsu and uh, you're going to get nothing but a warm welcome and a great atmosphere full of great people. And uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's one thing that I think that... Uh, that, that, that this stereotype is misrepresented. Not only that, you'll get people that go out of their way to help you and welcome you. Absolutely. I Any agree. gym. I agree. Mm -hmm. Well, next topic is the... I don't know how many people here... Well, I think everybody on the panel has heard about this, but maybe everybody at home hasn't. The UFC has actually decided to create a uniform for the fighters. Now, that means that every single fighter is going to have to you know, wear these uniforms and it's going to be sponsored by Reebok. Uh, what do you guys think about that? You know, we, we talked with Chris Camozzi uh, just a minute ago uh, briefly about this topic. And it's interesting to, to, to wonder what this is going to do for the smaller organizations that right. aren't the UFC, Bellator. These, these people that were helping the UFC and sponsoring and getting their show off the ground, they're going to have to go somewhere. They, they want that exposure. They want that somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's well, be interesting to see. I know a couple of things that they're doing with the Reebok uniforms is they'll kind of be customized a little bit to each individual fighter. Oh, okay. Like so, a onesie? Like a, well, <laughs> some of them might want a onesie, yeah. I was going to love this. Uh, no, I, could, I could already the, see it. They, they did, I would not wear a onesie. <laughs> they did talk about length of shorts per se, Ooh, style of shorter? shorts, different you colors, like <laughs> you know, different things like that. Uh, so, so they'll they'll custom a little bit. It's still going to be Jamal pretty generic, I think. Onesie? Uh, Jamal, yeah, <laughs> oh, only if he wants a Jamal onesie, you know, we we'll get him one. You know, I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm worried. I'm worried <laughs> that it's going to diminish the talent pool of the UFC because of these fighters making the decisions to maybe go elsewhere. I know the UFC is the big dog. Yeah. Right. But at the end of the day, like we, were, like we heard from Chris Camozzi, they're looking for the money in these fights. Mm -hmm. Well, and we Chris, Chris is in a little different situation because he's been to the UFC. He's been on pay-per-view. He's been on all different levels there. Most of these guys, from the day they started training, trained to fight in the UFC. I don't think they're going to turn that contract down, even if they could make more. If you have UFC here and Bellator, who's the next biggest thing, and you got a contract from both, you're going to take that UFC the contract. Name. It's all about the it's, name and the yeah. brand. There you go. It's, it's the, the brand. Name. The, the name mm -hmm. and the brand. It's and, and Joe Warren's a great example of taking the Bellator brand. Joe, and I know Joe from years ago, Joe's about the money. Mm -hmm. Joe can make more money in Bellator than he could in UFC. Well, I know what Nate Diaz thinks about it. He put it all over yeah. his Twitter. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, it's not appropriate for this either. <laughs> but he went and kind of tried to cover himself and say, oh yeah, oops, I didn't mean to say that. Listen, Nick, li you listen, Nick, the listen UFC Nick, we that all know your demeanor. We all know what you're trying to do. Come out and just say it. Yeah, we know how you, we know we know how you feel about the Nobody UFC. Nobody hacked Nick. your Twitter. Yeah. We know that it was you just saying sure own it, whatever. That's just <laughs> Nate. Me and Nate. We appreciate everybody for listening.
everybody. My name is Jacinta Lovato, and I'm one of the hosts of MMA Meltdown. On today's first show, we have a lot of people that came in through the studio. We have writers, fighters, producers, directors. As you can hear, it's really, really, really getting... We're really building up some good energy around um, this show and our very first episode. So today, I have with me... Kelly Duffy. And Kel... Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Kel I am one of the writers for MMA Meltdown, and I'm also a Muay Thai kickboxer. So you're a kickboxer? Yes, I do kickboxing. Are you an instructor? Or? No, actually I train out of Foosbox MMA in Westminster, Colorado. My next fight's February 7th. I will be fighting on Just Bank Heart in Colorado Springs. So this will be my third fight and I'm 44 years old. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. I mean, how do you feel about women in MMA? Do you think they have to work harder than the boys? Or do you think that they have more opportunities because there's less women in MMA? What do you think? You know, I actually think that women in MMA actually have more opportunity only because of the fact that women's fighting is so much better than the guys fighting. If you watch the men fight, not to take anything away from any of our guests tonight, they're kind of boring sometimes, but the girls, we go in there and we just bang. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I think a lot of people really think that the fights are entertaining with the girls because they don't have them on as often. It, that's true, too. I mean, um, obviously, UFC with Ronda Rousey, they brought more women in fighting. There's always Invictica, and there's three female fighters out of Denver that fight in Invictica right now. So, I mean, that's great, and it's wonderful. But even on the local level, the guys would rather see the girls bang than the guys. Oh, wow. Yeah, and speaking of women fighters, um, Ronda Rousey is in the news, and we're going to be talking about that in our episode tonight, um, because she had a little bit of a beef with Eminem. Eminem, as you may or may not know, mentioned Ronda, Ronda Rousey in, her, in his new song, and it was a little derogatory, and then Ronda Rousey turned around and said that she was actually flattered that um, Eminem would feature her in his music. What do you think about that? You know, um, for any female fighter, for anybody to bring attention to our sport, because obviously the female aspect of it is still kind of in the shadows, whatever. I mean, Ronda Rousey, I've got to give her credit. She's honestly not one of my favorite female fighters. Um, sorry, Kat. Kat's fighting her this, this January, dude. I'm going for Kat. Kat um, and I know each other. She trains here in Colorado. Um, but I got to give Ronda credit. She really handled it professionally, and it is what it is. So Eminem. Do whatever, we don't care. Wow, you heard it first. She said, Eminem, say whatever you want about Ronda Rousey. I don't know if Ronda was here, if she would be saying the same thing, but that's just my opinion. Well, thank you for um, stopping by and doing a quick interview with me. I appreciate your time. No problem, thank you.